Okay, cool. So we're now live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Marine Diaries second webinar in our educational series. My name is Rebecca Daniel, and I'm the director of the Marine Diaries. I'm really excited for today's session um, from using clothing for science communication to reducing clothing waste and creating seaweed based solutions. We are joined by some incredible businesses who are striving for sustainability in everything they do. With so many of us wanting to buy more eco friendly products and the need to combat global issues like climate change. It is fantastic to see that more and more businesses are paving the way for change. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone that we will be emailing out some exclusive discounts after the webinar, uh, a link to the recording and a short survey to collect your feedback. Um, so I will now hand over to my colleague, Mayan Koila, who will be the host of today's session. Hi everyone, I am Mayan and I'm the social media assistant here at the Marine Diaries. Um, and I will be your moderator throughout our Ocean, Ocean Positive Business webinar today. Um, so this webinar has been brought to you by the Marine Diaries. Um, just to mention quickly the structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to say hi to everybody and then we're going to give questions to each specific um, person. And without further ado, let's introduce our panellists. Um, Paul, if you go first. Hi. I'm the president of Annie and Clothing. We're based out of Victoria, BC, Canada, and we specialize in salvaging textile waste. So essentially we take all of your old clothing, we take it out of the landfills, um, shred it down into a mulch fiber, re-spin it, and then use that recarded yarn for the weaving process of our clothing. That really breaks it down sort of in the most basic of terms. Um, it is very much a global supply chain. Most of our textile waste comes out of landfills over in Asia. Uh, the whole reprocessing or recarding happens over in Europe. And then all of our clothing is manufactured over in Vancouver, BC. So our main market is coastal areas. We are best known for our heavier wool products, such as our Milton wool. Um, and we have been recycling textiles for about five years, although uh, the process of recarding or re Purposing textiles is a very old one that has been out of Italy for a couple hundred years now. Nice. Thanks, Phil. Um, and Majid, why don't you talk about Canadian Pacifico Seaweeds? Absolutely. Uh, welcome to Canadian Pacifico Seaweeds. My name is Majid. I'm the founder and current CEO of uh, the company. And we're essentially a food production uh, ecosystem service provi providing food production system. So we're primarily interested in the BC seaweed industry, and uh, we're essentially trying to bridge the gap between uh, climate change and providing ecosystem services and our uh, social benefits. So everything we do is based on the three pillars and um, of sustainability, and our mission is to develop the industry on those three pillars. And so we want to optimize ecosystem services and bring the most amount of benefits to our societal needs, as well as helping the socioeconomics keeping everything local and keeping everything uh, true to the, the pillars of sustainability. Now, to do this, I kind of dove into it um, in Bamfield, BC, uh, where I met the kelp godfather, Louis Gerald, my primary mentor. Um, and, you know, it started off as just, uh, just a plan to develop a farm and produce some sustainable food, um, keep it small scale. But I ended up finding that there was a lot of, uh, it's a really small industry and it's a growing industry. There was a lot of little problems that um, didn't essentially uh, allow it to scale up. One of those things being processing. Um, but the primary uh, flaws that I found were these claims around the industry where, you know, um, uh, certain certain benefits are, are proclaimed but are not quite attainable yet. Um, so, you know, we were working on developing the farm structure side of things first to be able to get the farms out there. Um, then we worked with uh, partners to develop the processing side of things. And now we're working with OceanWise and UBC and the Commissary Connect on developing the product side of it. So essentially the whole goal is to create um, the market so that there's now a demand for the farms 
And now we are able to attain those ecosystem services by scaling up uh, production in the ocean. It's basically a plant that's grown underwater, so it's taken up carbon. Um, you know, the, the bridge to climate change comes in the ocean and the bridge to social benefits comes in the products that we develop. Um, and essentially we have a no claims policy. So, you know, one of the big claims around seaweed is that uh, it's a great sequester of carbon. Now, while it's true, it can take up more carbon at a faster rate than our trees typically do, it doesn't actually hold on to that carbon content for a long term. So we're working on developing products that um, extend that time and uh, achieve true um, carbon sequestration, as well as developing products that uh, society needs. So in a nutshell, <laughs> we're no, in the seaweed industry from uh, production to manufacturing. Nice one. Um, and you, Patrick? Hey everybody, my name is Patrick Rin. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, I am a marine scientist and engineer by training and uh, I'm the founder of Waterlust, which is a uh, science communication company that we, that's what we like to call ourselves uh, that sells clothing, uh, clothing brand around the world. And Waterlust started, it was a, an experiment uh, while I was doing a PhD in uh, marine physics. And we wanted to experiment with ways to communicate science in more sort of outside the box um, methodologies, I, su I suppose. And along the lines, we did, like, acknowledged that clothing was sort of a, an interesting tool and it, and it provided a really interesting opportunity um, because every time people put clothing on, um, you have an opportunity to think and, and it's this repetitive behavior. We all have to put clothing on every day. And so we sort of hypothesized that, hey, if we could somehow integrate uh, marine science education into clothing, um, that would be a really powerful tool because every time you put it on, every time you interact with someone, it would create an opportunity um, to spread awareness and education and conversations. Uh, so we started that uh, making clothing, um, environmentally responsible clothing, um, using basically the most environmentally responsible methodologies we could, um, recycled materials, organic cottons, things like that, and integrating um, the design of a certain uh, ecosystem or species into the design of the clothing. Uh, so currently we have 15 causes that we support and we partner with marine, uh, marine researchers, uh, nonprofits, educators that are leading in their fields on that particular topic. And we work with them to take the knowledge and expertise that they have and try to pass that information along to our customers so that they are empowered with information so that when they wear their clothing and someone inevitably asks like, what is that really bright colored funky thing that you're wearing? they can say, oh, this is an abalone, or this is a whale shark, or this is a sockeye salmon, and they can help um, share the information that they've taken from the researchers and then disseminate it throughout their community. And if we, you know, we have customers in over 100 countries, and our idea is if we can integrate this over um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, um, it creates a network of awareness and uh, in science communication that can have a positive impact uh, in our fight to um, combat the environmental crisis. So that's sort of the concept. And uh, so far it seems to be working quite well and we're experimenting in all sorts of new ways to enhance our science communication work and uh, really empower our customers to uh, be leaders in their local communities to help uh, drive behavior change um, and really be leaders and you know, make the world a better place. So. But super excited to be here and thank you all for, for having us. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you all. I think that um, it's like a theme running of how there's so much power in the consumer and like our choices matter and make a difference. So yeah, I'm really excited to dig into the questions that I have for you. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, if you have any questions that you want to ask, there will be a Q&A at the end. So drop them either here. If you're on YouTube, we will also get to you. Um, so yeah, without further ado, shall I dive in with Paul and Anya? Yeah, so um, a really lovely quote that's on your website is fill your closet, not the landfill. And I think this is so powerful and it really embodies the power, like the movement of slow fashion. Um, so how did this idea of creating quality clothes that last rather than like following fashion trends come about? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think we all sort of have that one piece of clothing that we've had for way too long. There's holes in it. Um, you know, maybe it's a toque, maybe it's a sweater, maybe it's a pair of pants, maybe it's a pair of jeans, but essentially there's that sort of one piece in our closets that we all reach for and we just sort of feel comfortable wearing it. Um, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about that. I think these days we're very detached from our clothing and we're very detached on how it's all created. I think if we understood how much effort was put into textiles, whether it's the design or the sourcing or the manufacturing or anything like that, we would definitely, as a society, hold on to our clothing for longer. And that's definitely something that we want Annie and, and our clothing to represent. So we definitely do make our, our clothing to last because we find that once you've had that pair of jeans that you've broken in, they feel a lot softer. Once you've had that shirt that you have you know worn a hundred times, it just feels a lot softer. And it just is a little bit more comforting. You know, and it also, that piece of clothing, it represents something to you. It represents some time, some adventures. And that, you know, it was definitely one of the founding ideas of Anion is that maybe we need to get back to where our textiles were a couple, you know, generations ago where you would have that sweater for, you know, more than just a season. And that's really where that idea of Anion came from. And you can see it in a lot of our design as well. We really don't follow any of the fashions. It's very timeless pieces. And we really try to strive to keep all of our designs um, definitely more timeless, just in the sense that you can wear them out to dinner, you can wear them out to, you know, when, when the bars and restaurants were more open, you could wear them there, but then you could also wear them to meetings or out in the woods as well. So that's sort of where the idea came from for that one. Nice, and for any Canadians who, any non-Canadians watching, a toque is a hat. I learned that really recently. <laughs> um, and say that again? A toque is like a beanie, like you wear it on your head there. That's it. <laughs> um, so you talk about on your website using recycled fibers to form your clothing lines um, and you talk and it's called like salvaging 101. Are you able to just delve into what that means a little bit more? Yeah, so when Annie was created, we really wanted to have a Canadian company from start to finish. That being said, uh, the textile industry in Canada has all but shut down on an on a industrial level. So we never really grew any of our cotton here. It's just too cold. But all of our mills are shut down. All of the dye houses are shut down, as well as all of the woolen. There used to be quite a large wool industry here, but that's all shut down as well. So by the mid 2010, so around 2015, 2016, one of the last, the last large Canadian woolen mill shut down. And at that point, we had to look around and decide where we were going to support. So what sort of supply chain would Annie and want to support? <clears throat> um, and this is sort of when I started hearing rumors of salvaging textiles. So the salvaging of textiles is a very old process and you've seen it through cultures all around the world in a process called carding or recarding. And essentially what you're doing is you're making a dreadlock. So you're matting short staple fibers together into a very thick dreadlock type material or sort of hair. And then you're pulling it and you're twisting it until it is almost the same diameter or micron as the original hairs that you were matting onto it. Um, that's definitely it in the most basic terms. And then once you get that original, once you get that new micron hair or new spun or carded yarn, then you can use it for weaving and jerseying textiles. Now, typically this was done by ragmen in Italy. And it was always sort of leaning more towards a wool or a hair as you can get longer hairs and sort of cut them in half, fold them back onto itself and then spin it. And that's the original sort of idea of recarding. Now recarding textiles has been around for a couple hundred years, although it has never really been widely accepted um, in the hair textile world, I guess you could say. So a lot of the wool companies, a lot of the wool industry that is out there to sort of advertise virgin wool or any of those, um, they don't really like to talk about recycled wool just because it doesn't involve any of the grass 
land. It doesn't involve any of the feed, any of the sheep farmers, any of the shearers, anything like that. But what it does involve is pickers that go through sort of landfills, uh, ragmen that sort everything, shredders. So it's, it's an entirely different way of processing and creating wool. Um, and that's sort of what we talk about in the salvaging 101 process. So is that kind of like a different industry in itself, making Making. Yeah, it's, it's an industry within an industry. We still use natural fibers. So our clothing is still made out of cottons and wools. However, we're not using any sheep. A set, sort of think about it like that. Like we're not going out to any farmers. We're not using any shears. That whole side of the industry, we don't really touch because we use pre-created textile garments that have ended up in landfills. So the end result is almost identical. However, how we get there is an entirely different process. So when we say that we're using salvaging textiles or salvaged textiles, we literally mean that we're going to the landfills or scraps from mills all around the world. And we're reprocessing those into virgin quality textiles. So if you look at any of our goods on the website or in the store, we're based out of Victoria. Um, you can also just buy them anywhere. It's free shipping and handling over 150. Um, if you look at our clothing, you would never be able to tell that it is actually salvaged. So the process itself is entirely different. However, the end result is very similar to using a virgin wool or a sheared sheep wool. I just have one last question and then we'll have yeah. to wrap it up. But I just wanted to, I was just interested to hear about um, your, how you dye and color your clothes. Yeah, for sure. So when we are recarding or reprocessing yarns, um, we don't actually dye them. So if you go to our site, you'll notice that we launch, or if you've been following us, every year we launch a new colorway and it happens once a year because essentially what we need to do is rather than <clears throat> working with a design team, which is a little bit more typical where it's you want say blue or denim or whatever color you're looking for. And then you create your product sort of that way. We have to reach out to our pickers, the rag houses, and we need to see how much of which color we have on hand to begin with. And then once we have, you sort of break it down into your primary color palettes. So you shred up a bunch of color A and a color B, and then you actually recard them back together to get a tertiary or third colorway. So it's very much like learning how to color when you're in grade school with mixing your primary colorways. So that's how we avoid using any colorways um, in any of our textiles. So if you look on the site, we can get some pretty amazing colors, although a lot of them are gonna be more earthy rather than vibrant. Hmm, that's so interesting. Thank you so much. Um... For answering those questions for us and if anyone has any more please don't um please don't forget to put them in and we'll ask at the end um and now we're going to move on to Majid um who is the director at Canadian Pacifico Seaweeds. Hi there. Hey <laughs> um would you mind briefly describing how kelp is planted grown and then harvested? Absolutely so the very first step is, uh, you know, we're in the ocean. So typically ocean farming gets a bad rap, but this is the situation where uh, we're working with the ocean and um, actually providing benefits. The, so the more we farm, better it is, but we gotta remember that we're relying entirely on the ocean for everything. So um, we really have to understand how the ecosystem works and how the biology of the plant works, first of all, um, as we're relying on her for nutrients, um, you know, if we're situated in an area where uh, the, the situation is not right, then we're not going to grow any plants because we're not adding any fertilizers uh, to help the growth. So site assessment and selection is uh, essentially the first step. And then we plant some anchors, whether it's uh, cement anchors or drilled into rock or um, even some uh, different technology pipe methods that we are e easily able to remove. Those lines go straight up to buoys and uh, essentially we have a floating rectangular square in uh, the ocean, different shapes for different uh, areas. And there's culture lines that go across and these culture lines, we essentially wrap the twine around the culture line. The, the twine is now uh, 
grown in labs with uh, you know seeds planted on them. Um, there's slightly different methods that we can attach the seed onto the rope, but that's one method. Um, and essentially, we just wait for the ocean to do its thing. Plants grow, and we uh, come up along, pick it up, trim it, take it into the processing facility, um, or sometimes just take the whole culture line and hang it. We uh, have different processing methods and uh, go from there. And um, what challenges have you come across in order to harvest kelp sustainably? Yeah, so we, we harvest our plants typically in the fall season so that the plant has um, time to essentially grow and be a part of the ecosystem throughout spring and summer. Um, by the time we're harvesting our plants, 70% of it is already broken off and fed the environment. Now to, to harvest in the fall, that's when the weather gets you know a little bit rough and we have to time our, our uh, harvest season with the tides, with uh, how the weather's acting and also how the crop looks. Um, so, you know, working in the winter is a little bit of a challenge, but we work with locals that understand and uh, know the areas like the back of their hand. So um, keep things safe with the technology and whatnot. Um, so you mentioned um, at the start that seaweed, correct me if I'm wrong, but seaweed doesn't hold as much carbon as um, trees. I didn't know that. I thought because it, I thought anyway. Um, but one of your goals is to achieve this long term carbon sequestration via kelp harvesting. Um, are you able to just talk a little bit more about how that actually works? And um, have you gained any ground in achieving this? And Absolutely. So essentially, in a nutshell, um, trees are known as, you know, the, the one of the major carbon sinks on our planet. Uh, the, the fact is marshlands are actually also very effective. Um, but you know, these are terrestrial plants. And so the planet is 70% ocean. So most of our oxygen is actually coming from the ocean, uh, from specifically microalgaes. Uh, we're talking about macroalgaes. So the bull kelps, the macros, the, the brown and green stuff that you can see floating in the ocean, um, floating attached, you know, to the uh, substrate. And essentially, the thing is, this, these plants are the fastest growing plants in the world. Um, you know, they're growing about a uh, meter and a half every two weeks. So that's pretty much unheard of in the terrestrial world, right? So these guys are really hungry and they're constantly taking up nutrients. Some of those nutrients are carbon. And um, essentially they're, they're more effective at capturing the carbon quickly, but they break down every year. So at the end of the year, they end up on the beach. 11% of it ends up in the deep sea, uh, but most of it just breaks down back into the atmosphere. Now, by farming it, we're capturing this carbon. And then by the product development, we're retaining that carbon for different amounts of time. So when it goes into human food products, you know, about 15% gets stored and the rest we exhale back out. Uh, when it goes into uh, agri-feed products, it has the potential to reduce the methanes as well as the opportunity cost of developing terrestrial feed for our, our, our animals. Um, so, you know, that's between 40 to 60% and potentially reducing methane up to 80 to 90%. Uh, that's a project we're working on in a, a land-based system. So it's for a specific uh, component. You know, the easier steps are putting into fertilizer. That's 20% carbon retention. We're working on improving that to 80% um, by, you know, uh, working a different way of developing the fertilizer um, and even reaching up to 100% carbon retention in materials construction. So um, that's where this is super interesting because I'd love to follow up with uh, both the companies here today and uh, discuss textiles because um, seaweed is actually um, known to be, it's pretty much entirely fibrous. And so um, it actually would go well, just like hemp in, in that world. So, um, you know, that's now taking the carbon and putting it into something solid for a long period of time. Um, insulation materials, construction materials, that's how we're going to retain the carbon content for multiple years so that we're not affecting the carbon cycle by just slowing it down, but by retaining that carbon for extended years of time. And now it's actually helping store that carbon. That's super interesting. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> but so with COVID and everything that's been going on the past year, you have recently launched a product in response to this called Kelping Hand, I like the pun, um, which is a seaweed based hand sanitizer. Um, 
how is this sanitizer different from a regular off-the-shelf sanitizer? <laughs> yeah, so it was actually a really random project and um, it was a big collaboration project. Honestly, it was a side thing. Um, you know, I, I heard about the Vancouver Aquarium struggling through times of COVID and, um, you know, had that in the back of my mind. And then there's a company out in Europe, Guernsey Seaweeds, who came up with the original recipe of this uh, sanitizer. And kind of just had that in the back of my head. And then I was like, you know, um, I don't really feel right making money off of sanitizer during COVID. But if it's for a fundraiser, then let's see where this goes. So I just reached out to Guernsey Seaweeds and uh, they immediately shared the recipe. It was um, just a great story where a two seaweed companies from across the world <laughs> reached out to a distillery and an aquarium as a fundraiser project. And it turns out the product is actually, you know, the more we went into it, um, I mean, I was sold on it immediately, but uh, you know, there's actually a lot of uh, differences in terms of the carbon content that goes into um, developing this product. So we're glycerin free. I mean, we have glycerin in the formulation, but it's like point negligible percentage so that it's, um, it's just a formality for us to meet our federal approval. Um, but essentially glycerin is a high uh, carbon footprint product. And so we're using a natural alternative seaweed gel um, the seaweed gel is derived from plants that are, you know, capturing carbon in the ocean. So, I mean, again, it's not long-term storage in terms of years, but it's using a product to store this carbon and also the opportunity cost of not producing glycerin. Um, and then there's also health benefits because the seaweed gel itself is rich in vitamin E. Um, it's also rehydrating. Uh, glycerin is known to suck up the moisture from your hands, um, whereas this is doing the opposite. And it's actually it kind of progressed even further because that gel that we're using in the sanitizer is being looked at for skin cancer um, effects at UBC. So uh, we're going to involve that into uh, a bigger project there. Um, but yeah, no, essentially it kind of snowballed. It's a big fundraiser for the aquarium. It's, it's a prime example of um, the three pillars being met in terms of product development from seaweed. Um, and do you want to just talk a little bit more about your partnership with, is it Van is Vancouver Aquarium, isn't it? And how that partnership arose? Yeah, totally. So Vancouver Aquarium and OceanWise, um, you know, they're, they're one of the leading conservation efforts uh, I, in my mind globally and um, especially around our coast. And, you know, they're the link essentially to connecting Canadians to the ocean. Uh, you know, we're really fortunate to live on the coast. You know, we're boaters and fishermen and whatnot, but in the interior, they don't have the same experiences that we do. And so when they come to visit Canada, or sorry, Vancouver, BC, um, you know, one of the quickest routes to, to getting a glimpse into the ocean is by attaining, uh, coming out to the Vancouver Aquarium and, you know, getting um, an understanding of what's going on on the coast. So uh, it's crucial that we keep them afloat and you know they're they're not going anywhere they're transitioning more into a conservation effort um, as opposed to an aquarium so some some projects will be pulled back and you know they're still going full steam ahead with others so uh, one of those projects that they're going ahead with is c4 station so they want to affect uh, our coastal oceans by planting seaweed farms and so they've partnered with us in uh, developing some uh, various methods and technologies. They've also partnered with uh, my mentor, uh, Louis Drool and his company, as well as another company uh, based in Vancouver Island. And um, they'll be, we'll be working together on developing the seaweed industry and scaling it up to uh, bring the best benefits forth for the province. Amazing, that's so cool. Um, and we're gonna have to move on now to Patrick at Waterloo. Can we, um, hey, there we go. <laughs> hey, hey, Patrick. Um, How are you? You, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, you described yourself as a scientist who has a clothing company. How has this been an advantage um, and a struggle for you and your company? Uh, I think, I think science is really at the core of what we do and why we do it. So I think it's an advantage from a business perspective, I think it is easier to take someone that understands um, marine conservation, marine biology, marine physics, 
geochemistry, whatever the subject may be, it's easier to take someone that has sort of that background and to teach them business um, or to have them dive into business and learn business than take someone that is proficient in business and try to somehow teach them about the intricacies of, of marine science. So I think our sort of philosophy in terms of how we biz, build our business, it's a little unorthodox, but we really look for people um, that are scientists. And then we say, okay, try to find your niche, try to figure out how to um, you know, do whatever it is you need to do within the business. Um, and that I think is sort of, it's sort of unique. We make a lot of, we make a lot of mistakes and there's, there's plenty of struggles as we're trying to learn how to do all the different things that we do. Um, but what's really cool about it, I think is the underlying passion philosophy, um, our ability to, as a team to, we're all on the same page in terms of the scientific method, um, evidence-based decisions, um, that process that you learn um, through, you know, doing science of forming a hypothesis, testing ideas, um, questioning yourself, um, you know, examining when things don't work, which is an important thing. When things don't work, examining why they didn't, uh, why they didn't work. That whole mentality, I think, because the people we build the business around already have that is a, a huge advantage because as it turns out, scientists make, I think, really good business people, frankly. So um, it's, it's strange. And I think a lot of people, like when we meet other businesses and we interact with other people that are much more rooted in the conventional business world, they're like, who are these like, you know, dorks coming in that have like these random backgrounds and, and they're immersing themselves in that, in this, in this world. Um, but I think it's really exciting and fun and, and, it, and it's a really enjoyable process. Nice. Um, and when you talk about the like scientific process, is that in terms of just the business or is that also in terms of like your um, supply chain as well? It's honestly, I think it, it, it applies to everything. So we, we treat every process whether it's advertising strategies, um, manufacturing processes, um, financial strategies, everything that we do on every aspect of what we do, we sort of approach it with that same mentality that we would approach um, trying to solve an issue in the lab. Um, and it's sort of, we're very data-driven. Um, anything that we do, we wanna make sure it's, it's backed up with with data, with science, with, with evidence. Um, and that can be, that can be challenging, especially like if, when we work with, when we'll work with, you know, um, you know, manufacturing partners, uh, we're working with um, PR firms, we're working with advertising firms, we're all about the data. And, and just saying something works is not enough for us. We need to know that we need to see the evidence, we need to see the proof. And this is particularly hard when you're manufacturing clothing, um, where they're, you know, the clothing industry is is not really held to a particularly high standard in terms of regulation, at least here in the United States. So, um, you know, you'll have partners that will make all these very, um, very broad claims about the environmental benefits of maybe a certain technology, and then when you question and you kind of probe um, for the evidence you find that it's really um, not up to snuff in terms of what you would consider um, to be a standard for a, say a peer reviewed um, paper in the, in the science world. And that's really kind of what we look for. So it's, it, it, we have very high standards and we push our partners um, to adhere to those standards. But at the end of the day, I think that that, that mentality of evidence and testing hypothesis and kind of just constantly repeating that process, it really trickles down through our organization. Um, and it, it gives us the, I, I, think it, I think our customers recognize that it helps us build trust with our community so that when we're saying, hey, this is, this is a really good choice or hey, you know, we're trying to inspire behavior change. If we're trying to say, hey, maybe, nudge your life decisions in this direction, we really need to have trust with our community and we build trust through a process 
um, that is very transparent and is based in, in data and evidence. I like that a lot. I like that. Um, I've never really thought about the, I've never really thought about that in terms of business and science, how they sort of um, integrate so well. <laughs> um, they really do. <laughs> could you tell us a little bit more about the birth, life, life and death cycle your garments travel through and what those stages mean to a garment? Sure. So we do a, you know, they call this in the apparel industry, the life cycle assessment. Um, it's, we, I, I really love the idea of birth, life and death. I think it just, I don't know, it sort of anthropomorphizes the, the uh, idea of a, of a non-animate, you know, inanimate object. Um, but when we're looking at the environmental impacts of creating something, we have to look at all the different stages. And to just say something is environmentally good is, is not specific enough. Um, because as some of the other panelists were, were, were mentioning, you know, it takes a lot to make clothing. Clothing is a complicated, um, textiles are complicated to make, and there's a lot of different um, processes that go into it. So to kind of organize it and be able to, to digest what's working and what's not working and also being able to communicate that candidly to our, to our, um, our community, we break it into birth, life and death. So birth is, is basically what it takes to, to create something in the first place, like a shirt. What does it take from, from us to go from this shirt doesn't exist to this shirt does exist. Um, and that can be, um, all the energy that goes into all the resources that go into um, creating fibers, growing fibers, um, or if you're using recycled materials, um, heart, you know, recycling those from, um, from a source, um, all the energy, the water, the agriculture use, kind of everything that goes into the birth of it. Um, but that's only like one part of the equation. Then we have to look at the life. So life goes into how is this product going to perform? How long is it going to last? Um, if we make something that has a really, really small birth footprint, um, but it only lasts for a year, that's not really going to work. Um, and so we have to also consider longevity. We have to consider performance. Um, it has to be, you know, the product, any product that you make, and if you're trying to create it in a environmentally focused, um, you know, philosophy, you have to make sure that it is as competitive as products that aren't, right? If you, the, the example I always like to give is Tesla, like electric cars, um, you know, if Tesla cars weren't competitive, if they weren't technologically advanced, if they weren't fun cars to drive, if people, if they weren't good compared to a gasoline car, people wouldn't buy them. Um, people wouldn't just buy them like, oh, this is great for the planet. I'll, I'll buy a inferior product. We like to think that maybe that would happen, but it doesn't. People like to buy things that are good, that perform well. So you have, you really have to make sure in terms of the life category that your product is competitive with everything else in the market um, so that it, it can survive and be, and be selected. Uh, and then finally, there's the death category is, you know, nothing lasts forever. Um, eventually this, you know, your product is going to be discarded or it needs to have kind of an end life strategy. And for that, we look at um, is, can the product be recycled? Can it be downcycled? Is it going to end up in a landfill? If it does, how long is it going to take to degrade? What are the, you know, the consequences of that environmentally? And so when we, when we talk about is a, is a product environmentally responsible, we have to weigh these birth, life, and death factors. And we have to choose a strategy that um, is the most beneficial across the entire spectrum. And that what's really challenging is that a product that maybe is very, very good in one category tends to not be good in another. So for example, um, we use recycled synthetic materials in a lot of our swimwear. And one of the primary reasons we do that is that, you know, swimwear, especially here in Florida, if you're in the water all time, you know, it gets abused and it has to have certain, um, you know, mechanical properties in order for it to be a competitive garment. And so, you know, synthetic fibers work really well um, as swimwear, which that's really more in the life category. Um, that helps the product be competitive. It helps it be something that people want to wear. Um, and then when, but the, the downside of that is 
w one downside of it is synthetic materials don't biodegrade. So that you know elevation of the life category is actually a, a drawback environmentally in the death category. Um, and then, so it's anytime you're looking at anything, um, you have to all, there's always these trade-offs. And I think consumers oftentimes they want, as we all do, we want something that ideally would be great in every category, but unfortunately that is very rare to find. Um, so it's, we like to try to communicate all of this to our customers because it doesn't apply just to, to, uh, to clothing. Really this idea of birth, life, death applies to pretty much any product that you buy. And, you know, we want our customers to be informed and make decisions that are, you know, suitable to their lifestyle for, for their particular, you know, lifestyle goals and hopefully make an informed decision um, that is as environmentally responsible as, as they can. Thanks for that, that was really interesting. Um, my last question before we move on to the Q&A is, um, just about your really distinct patterns that you have at Waterlust, um, which links up to your conservation causes. Could you just tell our listeners a little bit more about that? The designs, I, I don't do the design work that's uh, primarily done by, uh, by Laura. And uh, Laura is a super talented um, designer. She's my sister-in-law. And um, she really looks for inspiration from the ocean and from species. And so her process in designing a garment is first uh, looking at, you know, visually looking at a species or an ecosystem um, that has, you know, that has a need, has, that ha needs advocacy for it. And then she really just starts brainstorming. She does, she, she does these little paper mock-ups. She's, she's always experimenting with how to take a, you know, biologically inspired um, pattern and applying it in a creative way. It, it's, it's certainly not as simple as just taking something and, and you know, cutting and pasting it on to a garment. Oftentimes, um, if you're talking about a lionfish or even, a, you know, an abalone shell, um, these are very intricate um, patterns. And oftentimes, if they're not placed properly on a a garment, you can have some very, very unfortunate things kind of be where they're not supposed to be. So she's incredibly talented, I think at, and this is stuff that goes way beyond my understanding of design work. She's really good at um, taking a biological pattern and executing it on a three-dimensional shape in a way that is flattering in a way that it, it, when you wear it, it, it really makes you look and feel good about yourself. And that I think is, is one thing that, that Laura is particularly talented and passionate about is using clothing, using fashion design work um, to really help someone um, feel good when you wear it, you feel good, it, it, it enhances your day, you have a smile when you wear it. So um, it's not easy, but I, I think, we attribute a lot of our design success to Laura's talent. And um, she's, she's really great at passing that on to other people and, and teaching it to other people. And it, it's really, really exciting to see, you know, we have another probably half a dozen new causes coming this year. And uh, the projects that she's working on and the designs she's working on are, are really stunning and exciting. And we, we can't wait to share them with people. That's very exciting. Um... Thank you for answering my questions. And we're gonna be moving on to the Q&A now. Um, but while I have you here, shall I ask Patrick, shall I go with you first? Your question is from Roxandra Colleen. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, what kind of packaging do you use for deliveries? And do you try and use small local couriers? It's, that's a great question. So we use, currently we use a, we, they're called poly mailers. I don't have one in front of me, but they are, um, they're basically little plastic, plastic bags that are made from 100% recycled material and they themselves are also 100% recyclable. And one of the main reasons that we use these is in the clothing industry, we get a fair amount of customers that um, send back their product for a different size. Um, we're, since we're direct to consumer e-commerce, we don't have a store that you can walk into and try on, you know, a bathing suit or something. So what we do is we use these poly mailers and they have, they actually have two sets of um, adhesive strips. So 
when you get the product and if it doesn't fit, you can use the same bag to send it back to us. And so that cuts down on waste. The downside about, about the poly mailers, really the only downside we go back to that birth life death is the death aspect of it. Uh, I'm not convinced that even though they are 100% recyclable, I'm not convinced that a very high percentage of our customers are ultimately recycling them. So we've been examining the benefits of switching to a more of like a cardboard solution. Um, but we have, and we've been testing that for longevity because we ship to, you know, to Asia, to Australia, New Zealand, we, and we need the garment to survive what can sometimes be a fairly violent trip. Um, but so far that testing has been pretty, pretty promising. Um, from like a carbon emissions point of view, the poly mailers are really nice. And the, 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 the cardboard ones, recycled cardboard ones have a slightly elevated carbon emissions footprint. But, you know, again, this is that trade off of, is that end disposal benefit better than having a little bit more carbon emissions? Um, we're still sort of working through that, whether we think it is or not. And then the final part was, do we use local carriers? I think, so by that we use USPS, which is the United States Postal Service. Um, which is our government um, run postal service for most of our, um, all, pretty much all of our domestic um, carriers, but we've, we've had not great experience with them internationally, especially during the pandemic for any customers on here, especially customers in England. You know, we've had, you know, two things taking two months to get to, to England. So we've actually recently switched over um, to DHL uh, an express option, a little bit more expensive, but much, much more reliable. Um, and uh, they've been doing a great job. We're really excited to be working with them. Hi, thank you for that. Um, and then I'm going to move on to Paul um, and ask the question, which, what this is from Katie Woodruff. Um, what market challenges were faced when creating a brand that breaks out of the normal fast fashion industry and instead focuses on alternative sustainable clothing? Yeah, um, thanks Katie for that question. <clears throat> One of our largest challenges is our product takes about two to three years to, of you wearing it for you to understand why it's better than everything else in your closet. So when you go out and you buy a alternative product, typically in fast fashion, they use a lot of lower grade synthetics or lower grade uh, natural fibers, or they mix them quite heavily. When you look at it on the shelf, that's sort of the best it will ever be. When you look at our product on the shelf, that's the worst it will ever be. So it's very difficult to convey that message to the customer that in fact, this you know $200 what seemed Canadian, so it's a little bit less in pounds or in uh, American currency. Um, it's difficult to portray the, the message that you shouldn't keep this in your closet, you shouldn't keep this ironed, you should be using this as a pillow, you should throw it down on the ground, you should use it as, you know, like wipe your dog's paws with it, take it out camping, wear it in the rain, go hiking in it. Um, and it's difficult because typically in sort of more adventurous clothing, we're so used to our shells and our puffies and everything, you know, slowly, slowly degrading as we wear them. And that's sort of where we end up with this sort of duct tape society where you go out into the back country here and everybody's puffies and everything are covered in duct tape and sort of, you know, we sort of mend our act of wear back to together. Um, our clothing literally needs to be beaten up. And it does need to spend a year or two of you, you know, attempting to destroy it before it gets beautiful and comfortable. It's sort of like a pair of jeans, you know, and jeans have taken a very long time to convince people that you should buy this extremely stiff, uncomfortable pair of pants, but it will get softer over time. So for us, the main, one of the main hurdles is that we can tell you that our product gets better over time, but of course we're the brand creating it. So it's taken quite a long time to create a community of people that are using our clothing, are beating it up, are telling their friends and sort of sharing that story. And it just takes so much longer for us versus fast fashion, where they're going to be producing a new item every 10 days, every two weeks. We very much are like, here, wear this shirt, come back to us in two years. So our lead time to create new customers is extremely long. So we've been around for about seven years. And for the first four years, it was it was difficult, you know, because there's no community 
the buildup behind you that's saying, hey, actually, I did buy this shirt five years ago. They are telling the truth. So that for us, that was definitely one of the, the largest hurdles that we have faced and still continue to face as well. Thank you for that. That's absolutely um, yeah, spot on, I think, with when it comes to fast fashion versus slow fashion. Um, and my last question is to Majid, and this is from Laura Williams. Have you conducted any species surveys around the kelp farm sites to see if the species biodiversity and or biomass has improved thanks to your kelp farms? Oh, excellent question. I dove right into it. Um, so, you know, there's actually not a whole lot of historical data around um, our coast, unfortunately, with uh, species distribution and whatnot. You know, when I first started, um, the, the last study was done like 10 years before, and it was done by Louis, uh, my primary mentor. So, you know, last year we worked with some UBC students and went around and did a kelp distribution uh, mapping study around the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, to try to map out where some of the beds were. Um, I started compiling data of working with North Island College and the Marine, Banfield Marine Station, um, the Science Center there. And so this year we went and did a distribution study or more of a species uh, study where we went and harvested about 24 different species and we've sent them into the lab um, to get analyzed for specific components. Um, so, you know, the biodiversity side of thing that comes with a scale up. And unfortunately so far, you know, most of the, the research efforts in terms of, um, you know, field research has been in terms of finding out what's been there, what needs to grow there, um, what needs more help. And um, essentially the, the main species that we have to focus on are the bull kelps. Um, so that's, we've kind of prioritized them as being the one that needs uh, the most assistance right away. And as we develop farms, we'll be doing a lot more ecosystem side of things as well to see not only the biodiversity of other kelp species, but fish species um, and see, you know, where we're able to uh, place the farms that optimize all those uh, deficiencies. Thanks. That was really, really interesting. Um, so we have one final question for all three of you. Um, I'm going to start with you, Paul, by asking you, what is your favorite product from Anian? Sure. So I would say that our my favorite product, as well as sort of the, the hero product of the brand, if you will, is definitely the modern Milton wool shirt. So the weave of it is similar to a pea coat, which you guys will be familiar with over in England. It's that formal double-breasted naval coat. So those are still issued to all the navies in the world as well. So we took that material, uh, it's typically 32 ounces. We trimmed it out to about 14 ounces and then we turned it into a shirt. So it looks like a shirt, it acts like a coat. It never smells, it never gets dirty since it is boiled, felted as well as woven. Dirt and grime just can't penetrate it. So you can literally throw it down onto the mud and it will come up clean. So it's pretty cool because it is a completely technical garment that is made from natural fibers itself. And then of the weave itself, we also use recarded and regenerated textiles. So there's no, uh, there's no sheep used, there's no dye used. We only need to wash the material with hot water and soap. So the environmental impacts are extremely low as well. So it's a shirt that acts like a coat. So you can wear it out in the rain here on Vancouver Island, similar to you guys over there in England. Um, but you can also still wear it inside to a meeting since it's wool, it's completely temperature regulating. So you never end up sweaty, you never really end up clammy. So it's, it very much is a one shirt meets all of your needs products. Um, a lot of the time people just don't believe us until they wear them and then they wear them for, you know, four or five months and they just don't ever take them off. So that's definitely uh, my favorite product. And I would tell you that that's also what the brand is slowly becoming known for as well. Nice. And you, Majid, maybe your favorite project that you've worked on or um, yeah, favorite. Paul's shirt. I want to buy Paul's shirt now. That was awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, no. Uh, so right now we're actually working on a couple different projects. Um, one of them, the vitamin B12 is the addressing one of the other claims around the seaweed industry. Uh, so seaweed is known to have a high vitamin B12 content and B12 is actually a deficiency in 
um, many parts of the world. So the thing is though, the B12 content is actually not bioavailable. So we're doing research on figuring out how to actually make this bioavailable so that when you're consuming it, you're actually getting that content. Um, the fact is the B12 is actually made by the bacteria that's grown on the seaweed as opposed to the seaweed itself. Um, so, you know, figuring out little scientific quirks to fixing our food to make it much more, um, you know, if you're having broccoli, for example, there's ways to have it to attain more nutrients, right? So the same thing with seaweed, um, you know, the, the, in its rawest form, in its most natural form, the least amount of processing is when we typically get the most amount of nutrients, unless there's things specific like vitamin B12 that we have to activate. Um, and so, you know, to promote eating the chips just by themselves, just dried. Uh, I mean, I do that lots and, you know, my dog does that, but um, it might be a new, new thing to most people. So, you know, to treat it like a chip, uh, we've created this uh, vegan based mayo as well. Actually, this is all our chef, uh, Nate. Um, and so essentially it's a vegan based kelp mayonnaise and honestly, it's quite good. So, you know, when you add the chip into it, you're getting the health benefits of the seaweed in its rawest form, just having a chip, but it's also kind of more of a snack that's um, like a chip and dip um, and it makes it easier to have it alongside your food, so. Nice one. Um... And Patrick, over to you. It's kind of hard. It's hard to choose your favorite product. It's like uh, trying to say which one of your children is your favorite, I suppose. Um, but I think I'm biased. So I obviously I'm a guy. So I, I, I lean towards our male products. I really love um, our board shorts being here in Miami. I, you know, essentially live in in board shorts 364 days a year uh so i'm those are the product i wear pretty much every day to work wearing them now um and they just it took us three years to develop them and part of that was because we were so just so focused on bad board shorts and we just refused to to launch them until they are absolutely perfect um but then another product that comes to mind is a new one that hasn't launched yet. Um, that's our new, we were making hats. Um, and we've been working on hats for over three years and they're launching in the next month or so. And they're just, you know, baseball caps um, with prints on them. And the part about that, that I really like, I'm so proud of is when we decided to make hats, we were doing the research and we realized that none of the manufacturers were actually using entirely recycled materials throughout the hat. And, but they, and there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of very prominent brands that say these hats are, are recycled, but when you dive into the details, you actually find out like the button, the snapback, the, the plastic brim internally in the hat was not recycled. And so we asked all these different factories we worked with, why they weren't doing that because there was no logical reason for not using recycled materials in in that application and they had no good answer they just sort of said this is the way it's done we don't do that and um, our philosophy is that we will always use the most environmentally responsible materials available and if there is a material that's available and it's it's easy to use it and no one's doing it we will not make the product unless it's using that material. So we drew a, lot, a line in the sand about three years ago with all the factories that we were you know, interviewing around the world and said, hey, if you don't use recycled materials on your snapbacks and your brims and your buttons on everything, then we're not making hats. And we had this sort of standoff that's lasted years. Um, and then they finally, um, towards the end of last year, they finally said, okay, we'll do it. We'll start stop making. We'll start sourcing recycled materials, and we're really proud about that. The hats look awesome, and when we launch them, we're going to share uh, the manufacturing um, contact information with the world, so that if any other brand wants to do that, they can do it. Because we just think that should be the standard, and and so we're really proud of being able to use our business to help shift the industry. Even it's a it's a small shift, um, but that's a really exciting um, prospect to just be able to kind of 
say this is the way it should be done and then see that that actually, even though we're a small company, be able to actually see that happen. And we're sure when other, other companies see the product and they're going to say, there's no reason not to go back to what we used to do. We're just going to, this is going to become the new normal. So we're really proud of that. Look for those to come in the next month and a half. We're going to launch them. That's awesome. I'm thinking I shouldn't have asked you guys to tell me your favorite projects now, because now I'm just going to go onto your website and buy loads of things. <laughs> But thank you again to all three of you guys um, for like participating in this webinar. I really enjoyed asking you questions about your business and getting some insights into the sustainability side of your businesses. Um, I think we've learned a lot about how you guys operate, um, about consumerism, how it can be positive and how we can make like good choices for our planet. Um, so thank you to everyone who's been listening and tuning in to the second webinar of the series um, that we're hosting here at the Marine Diaries. We'll be sending out a copy of this, which will have everybody's details. So you can go follow, um, follow along on all their stories as well. Um, and don't forget to follow us, the Marine Diaries, on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, to learn more about different conservation efforts and keep up to date on when our next webinar will be. Thank you and see you soon. Thanks everyone and thanks Mayan for hosting. I'd also quickly just like to say thank you for um, Emma for fielding everyone's questions. Um, if your question wasn't answered during the webinar and um, we were a bit pushed for time, we will be publishing an article on our website and we'll be asking all of the panelists to answer any questions um, that weren't addressed just now. Um, so thanks again, everyone, um, for attending and to our panelists and see you at the next webinar. Bye, everyone. <laughs>